Good afternoon. So we are on chapter six, but before that, I wanted to talk about the exam. So I don't have that graded yet. My plan is for Wednesday, okay, to have it all graded. Um, the that's my plan. So right now we're then switching on to chapter six. Okay, so chapter six, and then we have seven and eight are all convection. Okay, within chapter six, it's it's more about the understanding of all these kind of equations and relationships that will come in seven and eight. So it's getting that understanding of the background of convection. And then we have a lot of different convection correlations that you'll see in the, ne the next two chapters. Okay. All right. So first we're going to start off with is boundary layers. Okay. And you've had some of this within uh, fluids with the velocity boundary layer, right? So we have, you know, the, um, in this case, you see the free stream velocity here is the same velocity, and then it hits a flat plate, okay, at x equals zero right here, okay, and a um, viscous, basically a viscous effects with, you know, the velocity being, you know, zero at the surface, okay, neglecting any uh, micro scale or nano scale effects. We have this zero velocity at the surface, which creates this kind of shear, right? And with that viscous um, effects that are inside there, do um, you get this um, velocity boundary layer that occurs, okay? Um, as you kind of work your way, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll, they, with the velocity boundary layer, that is where you're at the velocity that's 99% of that free stream velocity, okay, is right here. So you're at any point, you're at 99% of that free stream velocity is that line, okay? So that is where that thickness is, and the velocity boundary layer thickness is, is that equation, okay? And what you see is the profile where you have again zero here and the velocity increases up until you hit that. That 99% is right here and then you go beyond it, you'll see the free stream velocity, okay? And that is our profile of the velocity, right? So what is important in the velocity boundary layer is that surface shear stress, okay? And the surface shear, shear stress is equation you see here, so from thermo, right? Or some from fluid, sorry. Um, you have your viscosity, and then you have this partial, du dy, where y is equal to zero. So the important thing in this and I've always gotten questions with this, with the understanding, is this is a partial with respect to y, right? So that means we're looking at the slope of this velocity within reference to the y dimension. So if we're at y equals zero, so this point, we're looking at this slope, right? Okay. We're looking at it off of the y-axis. So it is that is our slope, okay? We're not looking at it from the x-axis this way, no, because that would be du dx. We have du dy, so we're looking at it from that direction, okay, and how that slope changes, okay, as you work your way. So if you're looking at this velocity profile, it actually, when you get earlier here, it's like we're squishing this velocity profile. So the same kind of trend, but it's getting squished within that height. Right? Or here, as that um, that boundary layer thickness gets bigger, it's getting stretched. Okay, so it's that same kind of profile is now stretched. Okay, and 
what that does is make that slope change, okay? Here, because it was squished, we have our slope change like that, okay? And again, all these are in reference to zero, so it's this, and this one would be you know, in reference to that, okay? And we see that the slope actually gets smaller, okay? So that means as x gets bigger, so as you're working your way on x, this shear stress, or this du dy at y equals zero, gets smaller, so the shear stress goes down, right? Because this is just a property, okay? Okay. And the boundary layer thickness increases in the flow direction, right? This and that's just because the effects of viscosity penetrate further and further in the free stream. So that's why, you know, as you're working your way, that effects of viscosity penetrate more and more. So that's why that boundary layer thickness gets bigger and bigger as X increases. Okay. okay. So we have to start with the velocity boundary layer because that will end up influencing, we'll see, in, is the thermal boundary layer, okay? So when we look at now, this is our new part. This is the heat transfer part. We have the thermal boundary layer, okay? And it has a corresponding thermal boundary layer thickness, okay? So we see it has that subscript T, okay? Where the velocity one has no subscript, okay? When no subscript is, talking about the velocity boundary layer. The subscript T is talking about the thermal boundary layer, okay? So that one is, we're gonna look at our, our schematic again. We have T infinity, so that's some flowing fluids temperature, all uniform right here. And then it hits this flat plate, right? Okay, and the flat plate is at a constant temperature. So that flat plate is being held a constant temperature so right there we have ts so it's you know same with right here that would be ts also the surface temperature is constant okay we're over here okay all right so the boundary layer for the thermal thermal boundary layer thickness defines when you get to 99 percent of of that that difference between the two. So here you have TS minus T infinity, okay? And then this is TS minus the T, okay? So at this point right here is where this relates to 99% okay, of it. So same with right here, 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 as you work your way on that boundary, in that um, thermal boundary layer, okay? And this one, as you saw with the velocity boundary layer thickness, increases again, okay? And that's because we see the um, effects of heat transfer penetrate more and more as that it keeps penetrating into that boundary layer and it makes it increase, okay? So then we take that and we can apply, let me make this point a little smaller, at this location. We can apply Fourier's law, okay? And that's what you see right here, okay? And that's because at that point, at the, right at the plate, the velocity is zero, right? Because you're right against the plate, so that's that boundary condition of velocity being zero. We can apply Fourier's law on the fluid side, okay? Right at that point, okay? So that means right here, if we look at slope of that point, so the slope of that temperature profile, going back right to that point where y is equal to zero. And again, we're looking t, dt dy, right? So that's 
this slope, right? And we have our thermal um, coefficient, right? So we have then Fourier's law, right? So this is our heat flux at that location, right? But we could then relate that back to the Newton's law of cooling, right? If we take that point and just have Fourier's law at y equals zero, and then set that to Newton's law of cooling, now we have a relationship, if we just solve for h, we have the convection coefficients definition, okay? So that's where that magic h value comes from, okay? And the k value, right, is constant thermal conductivity, and then our temperature difference, Ts and T infinity, they're both, you know, T infinity is a constant, Ts is a constant, so this is a constant. So that means the only thing that's changing, then, is this dt dy at y equals zero, okay? As you're moving along this flat plate, we got to look to see what's happening, right? And again, if we just squish this temperature profile, just like we did with the velocity one, so we can squish it over here. So if we squish it right here, okay, and then you know, stretch it over here. Okay, what'll happen? As we see, we'll see a bigger slope. And again, it's in the y, off of the y direction. So it's this angle, right, for the slope. And then we'll see a smaller slope as we get it further and further along. Okay. So that means as x goes up, Right? As we work our way along this, this flat plate, the convection coefficient goes down. Okay? And that's because that dt dy at y equals zero changes. Okay? So if h is going down, so is your, you know, this is decreasing, so is your heat flux. So as x goes up, your heat flux down. Right? Same thing, because it's just this parameter that's defining. Alright. So, so I had a question. Yeah. Um, like, how or what's the kind of the reasoning um, behind uh, like equating the, like the QS and the H, like the, the the Fourier's law and the Newton's law of cooling. To get the equation, we're we're basically trying to get what convection coefficient is, right? Otherwise, if we didn't, we would have to solve our problems with knowing this. And really, we end up doing that. That's lumped into the h value that we've been we've been using h in the earlier chapters, and it just gives you a value without where it's coming from. Well, this is actually where it's coming from. This is the basis of that Newton's law of cooling that defines what that convection coefficient is. Where does this even co come from? So we're just relating at that location Fourier's law to Newton's law of cooling so we can get our equation for H. Okay? Because otherwise we don't have a fundamental equation that defines what H is. It was just a parameter previously, but is it one? Is it ten? Is it a hundred? Right? And that actually, or a thousand. And that actually comes from this equation and knowing what this the h actually comes from. That that's the main parameter. That dt dy at y equals zero is the one that's defining whether your convection coefficient is one, ten, hundred, thousand. Right? That's really the the value that we end up having to get 
to get that eight, that convection coefficient. Okay, so it's just giving kind of more clarity to what the value is as opposed to just being a number. Correct, yep. So that means we need this temperature profile, right, of this boundary layer, thermal boundary layer, to get then the convection coefficient. Okay. And we'll get to that in a second. So then first we talk about is, as you see, saw here, the H was changing, right? We said as X goes up, H goes down as we worked our way along that point. So at this point versus this point versus this point, we had a different convection coefficient. So that means that's that local convection coefficient, which gives you a local heat flux. So that means at this point, it's gonna have a different convection coefficient than this point, and they're gonna have different heat fluxes because the convection coefficient is different, right? So if you wanted to know at a single point, you could use this relationship, the local, okay? But in a lot of applications, we're looking at this whole plant, like this could be a wing, right? Surf this wing kind of surface here. We want the con convection coefficient over the whole thing and not to look at an individual point. We want kind of the average or on this flat plate, we don't wanna know, have to worry about local. We wanna get what that average is overall, right? So that's where, if we have our average convection coefficient, then we can get our heat flux overall, right? So this then is our amount of heat for the whole thing, whether it's the swing at the top or the flat plate on the bottom, then we just need the overall surface area and temperature of the surface T infinity, right? Because this temperature of the surface is being held constant in this problem, all right? So then area, and then so that means we need this average convection coefficient to relate the whole thing and just use one h value okay well let's take that h average and try to create it from the local information so if we look at the overall total heat of that wing or that flat plate we would just be averaging the local heat flux not averaging integrating the local heat flux over the surface area so we're basically just you know integrating over the surface area to get the total heat. Same with this. We're integrating the local over this whole thing to get the total. Okay. Well, we can plug in what that local heat flux is. We have an equation for it above. So we put that in there. Okay. Ts minus T infinity, it's pulled out of the integral because it's constant. And it's H that's really just changing over that surface area. Right? So then we know now we now know that we could just use the get the average convection coefficient and apply that. Okay, so we could just integrate H right, over that whole thing and then H over the whole cross sectional area and then divide by the overall area and that will give us our average H. And nice simple, this simplifies to one over L because if we're looking at a flat plate like you see here, you know, into the board or out of it, or board, I should say, screen, let's say it's got a width of W. Well, this area, so this would end up being one over, let's say, L is this length, right? So L and then W, so that's the overall area. And we have this integration of over the whole surface area. So let's just integrate over the whole surface area. Which is H and then this DA ends up being X and then W is a constant, okay? there um, and because we're integrating across X where W is just some same thing crosswise and it doesn't influence the convection coefficient so we end up seeing that W cancels it's constant we get pulled out cancels and we get this nice 
simpler, even simpler relationship for a flat plate in parallel flow. All right. So then we also have, you know, boundary layer transition. You learned a little bit about this in fluids, right? Where you have laminar region, you have a transition region, and then you have a turbulent region, right? Where we see kind of a rough kind of outline of what's going on within those regions. So within the laminar region that you see here, you see these nice orderly streamlines, right? So flows nice and orderly, nice and organized. You know, there's just these nice streamlines that occur. And then as we go further and further along the plate, right, you can start getting transition, right? We get into this transition section, okay? And that transition section looks sometimes like laminar, sometimes like turbulent, and switches back and forth, and it does it randomly, okay? So it has this kind of transition section where it can look like laminar, look like turbulent. Um, and then we hit the turbulent section, right? And within that, you see these, you know, now you see these, you know, the arrows are creating these vortices, which makes this highly chaotic flow which has a lot of mixing going on. So, you know, flow, fluid particles up here could make their way down here, you know, down here can make their way up here, just because there's so much mixing and chaotic motion, it's not this nice, highly organized flow. It's, you know, chaotic and things move moving all over the place. Okay. So we utilize, and you saw introduced in fluids, the Reynolds number, right? The Reynolds number is our ratio, right, of inertia forces to viscous forces. And we'll introduce a whole lot more parameters and heat transfer and just like you saw with the biot number, it has a ratio, right? So this Reynolds inertia over inertia, uh, viscous. Okay, so that helps us quantify whether you're laminar or turbulent, right? So if you're highly viscous, like relative to inertia, you know, a lot of viscous forces that keeps the fluid organized, it keeps the streamlines going, where if you have very high inertia forces relative to the viscous, now the velocities are pushing things around and moving it all around, and that's where you get that chaotic motion, okay, in the turbulent region, okay. And what do we define between those is a critical Reynolds number. So in this flat plate, this critical region would tell us that transition. Okay. And it really has a range for it. Okay, so there's 10 to the fifth, and between 10 to the fifth and three times 10 to the sixth. But in the book, they're really just going to utilize this one value, right? And be like, below that, we have laminar flow. Above it, we have turbulent flow. Okay, as a, kind of our single point of our critical um, value of defining whether we're in the laminar region or turbulent region because equations change, right? Because you can see just by looking at the fluid in the boundary layer, how much, you know, with the organized versus disorganized changes things, okay? So that makes, you know, equations being different when you're within those two regions, okay? And if you actually look at, you know, the, you know, velocity profile for laminar, you know, again, we're looking at, this slope right here, the turbulent one you know, has a slope very much more more steep, right? Okay, because it's du dy again, right? And that's in this viscous sublayer down there, okay? And they have this region within that turbulent um, velocity profile. And then you have this very turbulent section up top where you have, it's very much just inertia forces driving everything. Um, and then the buffer layer is kind of that in-between 
Okay. I already talked about this. Um, effect of transition on the boundary layer thickness and the local convection coefficient. So we're just kind of looking at these profiles and we, we already looked, show this. This is showing in the laminar region right here that the boundary layer thickness is increasing, right? And then we show the convection coefficient is decreasing, right? As X increases. And that's what we showed right here, right? As X increases, convection coefficient decreases because that slope is changing, right? So that's that profile right here. It's decreasing. We hit this transition zone and it jumps us all the way up and we see at the start of the turbulent region, it's very much higher this initial convection coefficient. And we can see that with what we had here for these slopes, okay, within that profile. We see here the turbulent profile has a much higher slope, that dt, or this is du, uh, dy, but dt, dy is going to look, this have that kind of similar profile to it. Um, so you're going to get that higher convection coefficient there. Okay? The one thing, that though, that happens is, see this? drop down in the convection coefficient is not as steep as the drop down from the initial convection coefficient in the laminar section. And the jump from here to here is our transition zone. The other thing that can happen for turbulent flow is you can trip flow to turbulent flow and skip even having a laminar section. Let's say we, you know, had a flat plate and we have this fluid flow, but we put, and this is our flat plate, but we put something there. So then the, the fluid flow trips and creates that mixing right off the bat. So we now have turbulent flow over the whole flat plate. Okay, so we've tripped it. And it's called. All right, boundary layer equations, right? We said right here that convection coefficient comes from knowing the temperature profile, right? So that means we need to figure out the temperature profile, okay? And at y equals zero, okay? So that's where the boundary layer equations come into play, okay? So if we take a little section right here, dy dx within this boundary layer, okay, and we're going to look at the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer, okay, means we're going to end up looking at steady state, two-dimensional, incompressible flow, constant fluid properties, and negligible body forces, okay. Um, we're going to apply the conservation of mass. Okay, Newton's second law of motion, right? And then the conservation energy, right? So the conservation of mass and Newton's second law of motion, so you saw within fluids, conservation of energy is the new part, right? So within this boundary layer, we have some simplifications we can do, right? We have some terms that we can simplify. The first one is this. And that's showing that the velocity in the X direction it change within it is much less than the change within the y direction. So what does that mean? If we're looking at the velocity as we work our way up this, it's changing more because you know we're in the y direction, we're move, moving up. Versus the x direction would be from this profile right here change to this point. So this point to this point would be the change in the x direction. Well, that change is much, much smaller than the change you see in the y direction. So we can neglect that term uh, when it comes up okay, in the Newton's second law of motion, or if it came up in conservation energy. And the thermal boundary layer has a similar thing. With temperature, it's the same idea. If we're looking at the temperature profile, the y direction is changing all a lot right there. 
versus if we looked in the x direction with that temperature changing that we would see that profile it'd be this point to this point okay and that's not changing that much in comparison to the y direction so we can again cancel off that term in the conservation of energy all right so then the last one is the pressure change okay so in newton's second law of motion the pressure change say from this point to this point within the boundary layer we can just assume it's the same as the pressure change from this point to this point outside the boundary layer okay and that's what this is it's approximately equal because the boundary layer is so thin that we can just look at the overall the total you know, the p infinity pressure change all right, so we apply our conservation of mass, right? So we see it here. We have our conservation of mass. And what this shows us, right, is just the mass net outflow. Okay, so this is our net outflow. Of mass. All right, mass would be easy to see if we just put in multiply density times this term and then set our little cross sectional areas. Okay, and now you can see that's mass flow and the area is constant, the density is constant, so that's why it's divided out. Okay, over that little cube. And then when we apply Newton's second law of motion to the boundary layer, okay, we have what we see here. So we have our terms due to the fluid motion right there. So that's showing us uh, the net rate at which X momentum leaves the control volume, okay. And then we see on the right, we have the pressure change. So this is our net pressure force. And then the last term is our viscous shear stress. And that one you see only has the that in the y direction for the viscous shear stresses because we canceled off the x direction. Okay. All right, so this is second Newton's second law of motion that we can apply to the boundary layer. So now if we do the conservation of energy, right, we have on our left is our net rate of thermal energy leaves the control volume due to the bulk fluid motion. Okay, so this is our net thermal energy leaving the control volume. So let's do net. Leaving due to fluid motion or advection. Okay. Then we see this first term is our conduction. Okay, y direction conduction. And then the last one is our viscous dissipation. Okay, and this one for a lot of applications, this can be neglected. 
this term. It ends up being small, okay? But it ends up being very large and say supersonic um, flight conditions. Velocities are high, it creates a lot of viscous dissipation. missing that I wanted to mention. Oh, so we're looking at these equations to try to solve basically what that temperature profile is going to be. Okay, so then we can utilize that to get that slope and get what the convection coefficient is. Right. So this defines from conservation energy on that cube right here. Okay, within that boundary layer. All right, so then first step is trying to understand these parameters, okay? And the first step of this is the main dependent variables that we're looking at is that shear stress for velocity, right? Okay, so the velocity profile will define the shear stress. And then in the temperature profile, will define the heat flux or the convection coefficient that we're looking for, okay? So those are our two, you know, variables that we're trying to get out of this, right? Um, so then what's the independent variables? What are the things that then change those parameters, that change the dependent variables? So we have a whole bunch, right? We There's geometry-based ones, so like size, overall size of the thing, the L, like the characteristic length. If you're looking at flat plate, the overall length of the plate. The location, as we said, it's changing as we go from here, 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 here. So the location then matters, okay? So we have X and Y. The overall velocity matters, okay? So that's our overall velocity, or U infinity. And then fluid properties matter. So hydrodynamics, that's density and viscosity. And thermal, it's our specific heat and thermal conductivity. Okay. So now let's relate these different parameters. If we're looking at the U velocity within the boundary layer, they're a function of all these different things, right? Our location, length, the overall length of it, if it's a flat plate, the overall length, that free stream velocity, density, viscosity, all those different things define what's happening, okay? If we look at the shear stress, you know, it's all those same ones except Y is gone. And that's because we're just looking at Y equals zero for the shear stress, the location right on that flat plate or on that surface. So there's no, you know, Y is not then an independent variable because it's always the same location. <laughs> All right, we can do the same thing for the conservation of energy. And that's temperature, right, that we get out of it. And temperature, so we take all these things, because temperature depends upon velocity, so it already has all those parameters too, okay? And then we have our new ones for this, from the conservation of energy that temperature is dependent upon. Okay. Same with the convection coefficient. Oop, one too many there. We have these. Doesn't have y again because it's dt dy at y equals zero has that dependency to it. So y isn't a function. And then we have again these new ones from the COE. Okay, so that's a lot of different independent variables. So let's see if we can simplify this by non-dimensionalizing it. Okay. And that means just kind of basically just getting rid of our dimensions, right? So we make x star, and that's x divided by L, right? So that would be meters divided by meters. So that non-dimensionalizes the x dimension, right? So if we take this one, though, and want x, x is then x star times L, right? If we want y is y star times L, and then we see u for our 
x velocity or y velocity we've done it and then for temperature we've done it right and we could solve for t here too rearrange and solve for t so now we have relationships and to get what you see down at the bottom of the screen we take all these different relationships okay ones from these and these and plug them into these equations so in this one we would plug the equation we have for the u velocity in there for x in there u here u here y there v there so for all these different parameters we would plug them into there and then see what comes out of it and if when you do that and move things around you end up with this equation okay it's a non-dimensional form of the x momentum equation for the boundary layers well the real neat thing that comes out of this see everything's non-dimensional but we see the high you know Reynolds number is there and how much then it also shows that Reynolds number is a big parameter that defines that um, that velocity distribution right and then when we do this for the conservation of energy right we do the same idea we start we go to our conservation energy equation we plug in those equations we had for y u t y x u all those things that we have here right plug them in and see what we get out of it and we get this equation but it also has this Reynolds number and it has the Prandtl number so we know Reynolds number is big because it defines what we have for the velocity distribution. But then we also have this Prandtl number, and that'll be a big one for uh, defining the temperature distribution. Okay. So now we have a new parameter. Not only do we have Reynolds number, we have Prandtl number. We now know is a big factor in the um, in the temperature distribution, which defines then the convection coefficient. All right, so we need to define this new parameter, okay, this non-dimensional parameter. We have Reynolds number, which we already defined, okay, and then we have Prandtl number, okay, right here. Okay, so that's the part that's new, okay, so that is the ratio of the momentum and thermal diffusivities, okay, so this one is our momentum and thermal diffusivities. Okay, so it has those ratio of those two. And really what this Prandtl number will tell is which ones it's, you're going to find out it's going to show, you know, whether the um, velocity boundary layer increases faster than the thermal boundary layer, or does the thermal boundary layer thickness increase faster than the velocity boundary layer? And this um, this Prandtl number really defines that. Okay. All right. So now we know the important non-dimensional parameters, but if we now take instead of doing for U and shear stress we use the non-dimensional form, okay? So we take u star, and it's just a function of x, y, and Reynolds number at that length, okay? So that just went from all these parameters. So here we have six. Now in, in the non-dimensional world, we only have three, okay? We've narrowed that way down if we work with non-dimensional parameters for geometry where we can utilize something from one size to another in the same relationships okay so now if we do that same thing with shear stress and plug in for u y okay the shear stress equation which is that you know that slope at y equals zero du dy at y equals zero we get this equation which if we put that into our local friction coefficient we get this okay and that shows that this part right here 
is just a function of location, x, and the Reynolds number. Okay. Or your local friction coefficient is a function of x, the location, and Reynolds number. And if you were looking for friction coefficients in fluids, you would see you'd have lots of equations that are just a function of location and Reynolds number, right? Which we just showed those are the big functions for that parameter, for that local friction coefficient, okay? So let's do the same thing with the new stuff with the conservation of energy, okay? All right, so if we do this for T star, for temperature star, the non-dimensional temperature, we now only have one, two, three, four parameters, right? Where we had, you know, all of these, right? It was almost overwhelming there with the number of independent variables we have, but now working in the non-dimensional world, we just have X star, Y star, Reynolds number overall, and Prandtl number. So a lot less parameters. And now if we take our equation we have for convection coefficient, so that's the same one back here, right here, okay, and non-dimensionalize it. Okay, so plug in for T, the non-dimensional non equation, Y, right? Plug those in, we get this. And we end up canceling these cancel with just putting changing the sign. So we get now this, okay, which is equal to H. So we get this, which is equal to H, right? Well, if we rearrange for dt star over d y star at y equals zero, we get h l over k f, right? And that is just ends up being a function of x star, Reynolds number, and Prandtl number, okay? And we're gonna call that the Nussel number, okay? So the Nussel number, is equal to that, and it's only a function of those things, okay? So the Nussel number is a new parameter, and that is our ratio of convection to pure conduction heat transfer. Okay. So, that's what's being shown here. And that ratio is equal to the Nussel number, which is equal to this. So our Nussel number is that parameter that we're trying to define, is that, that partial of the temperature, um, temperature profile. And then by looking at this, we've found out that it is just a function of those parameters. And lo and behold, in chapter seven and eight, you're gonna see a lot of equations that are just a form of those three parameters, right? So if, but in, actually if you wanted the average Nussel number, you're gonna end up seeing it's just a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number, okay? Versus the local doesn't have the bar on it, so it has a location dependency right here, right? So we're going to see lots of different equations for a flat plate, a cylinder with flow over it that just are functions of Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Okay. And that'll give you a Nussel number, which then you can use to get your convection coefficient. All right, so now we'll do a few examples, or a couple of examples in here. So we have 6.24. Experiments have shown that for airflow at T infinity equals 35 degrees Celsius, 
and velocity one 100 meters per second, the rate of heat transfer from a turbine blade of characteristic length L1 is equal to 0 0.15 meters, and surface temperature TS1 equal to 300 degrees Celsius is Q1, which is 1500 watts. What would be the heat transfer rate from a second turbine blade of characteristic length L2 equal to 0.3 meters operating at TS2 equal to 400 degrees Celsius in airflow of T infinity 35 degrees Celsius and velocity to 50 meters per second. The surface area of the blade may be assumed to be directly proportional to its characteristic length. Okay, so we have these two turbine blades that you see, and you see them in the drawings here. And we have one where we know T infinity, we know velocity, we know its length, we know 300 degrees Celsius, and they actually did an experiment and measured that you get 1500 watts off of that blade. Now we have the second turbine blade, but the velocity is different. T infinity is the same. Okay. The surface temperature is different. Okay. And area is different, but it's proportional to length. And we want to find what uh, Q2 is, right? That heat, what is that heat coming off of? that new turbine blade using the information from the other one. Okay. Well, we got to understand what defines it first, right? So if we're looking at this, this is convection, right? So that's Newton's law of cooling and the um, And the convection coefficient, right? We don't, have, we have no values of the convection coefficient given to us. Okay, so we have to look at the convection coefficient. So we bring out no fault number, and we're using the average over the whole thing, and that's equal to H L over K, the average K, or average H, that R over it, and it's just a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Okay, Reynolds number defined by L, the length, and Prandtl number. Right. So let's start off with figuring out what each is Reynolds number is and what each Prandtl number is. Okay. That's what you see at the top. So first off, we end up getting 15 divided by the dynamic viscosity of the first experiment. And then the second one is 15 divided by the dynamic viscosity of the second experiment. Well, if we assume constant properties, since the temperatures are T infinity is the same, and you know that I mean the surface temperatures are different, so there might be a slight difference in the average temperature between T infinity and the surface. So the dynamic viscosity might change some, but we're neglecting it. We're saying it's small, so that we can um, in, in neglecting that that minor change in the the dynamic viscosity, or kinematic viscosity, sorry. Um, so the if that's the case, then the Reynolds numbers are the same, okay? All right, and we, so that means we have the same Reynolds number. If we say this is the same, these two are the same, then we're just gonna end up getting the same Reynolds number of one, for the first experiment with that blade is equal to the Reynolds number of the second one. Okay. Prandtl number, it's showing it being the same, right? But what did we have as Prandtl number is the kinematic viscosity over the thermal diffusivity. So that's this. Well, those are properties also. So we already assume constant properties. So then this and this are the same, so then the Prandtl number one is equal to Prandtl number two, okay? So that means the Prandtl number is the same, right? Well, if we go back here, Reynolds number is the same, Prandtl number is the same. It doesn't matter what that function is that's there, whether it's polynomial, whatever, if those are the two parameters that are changing, and if they're the same in this, between these two experiments, you're gonna get the same 
NISL number. So that means the NISL number for experiment one is the same as the NISL number for the other experiment, the new experiment with the bigger blade. Okay. So that's what you see here. The NISL numbers being the same. Now we put in HL over K for one and two. And we have then that H2 is just the relationship like that, okay, when we, re when we rearrange it. H1, we can get from Newton's law of cooling on experiment one. And if we rearrange for H1 and then plug it into here, that's what you see in this bracket. So that's our relationship now for the convection, co the new convection coefficient for the second experiment. We have Q1, we have L1, we have L2, we have these temperatures, and we can we have a way to relate the areas, but we'll get to that in a second. But we're still trying to solve Q2, right? So if we just set up Newton's law cooling for the second experiment, it's this, right? Well, now we have a relationship for what H2 is. So that's all of this. So if we put that into H2 in the Newton's law of cooling for our second experiment, Okay, we end up with an equation that looks like this, okay? Well, we have all these temperatures given. We have Q1. The only thing we got to think about is our areas. Well, the areas, they said, are proportional to lengths. Okay, so that means this would be similar to L2 over L1, which ends up making these cancel and these cancel. So that means it's just the temperatures in Q1. And we get 2,066. Okay. So it doesn't, you can't just take the number and say, oh, L was 0.15, L2 is 0.3. Let's just double it, right? That would have gave us 3,000 watts, right? If we just doubled the heat transfer just looking at L, right? But that's not, we would have been off by 1,000, almost 1,000 watts, right? So that's a huge error just by looking at it that way. We have to understand the parameters that define those changes, and that's what we did with looking at Reynolds number, Prandtl number, Nussel number, and seeing how those scales of, of sizes change using our non-dimensional parameters. All right, so the, only, the other thing that we would have to be careful of is in this problem, right, the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number end up being the same. If they weren't different, or, or sorry, if they weren't the same, right, if they were different, now we would have to know how that function changes. Like, what is that function there that utilizes the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number? Is it a polynomial? Is it, you know, exponential? Is it a power law? What's there? All right, we'd have to know how that changes if the Reynolds numbers change between this experiment and this experiment. Any questions? All right, we got one more to do. Six point three one. Forced air at T infinity of 25 degrees Celsius, velocity of 10, is used to cool electronic elements on a circuit board. One such element is a chip, four millimeters by four millimeters, located 120 millimeters from the leading edge of the board. Experiments have revealed that the flow over the board is disturbed by the element, and that convection heat transfer is correlated by the expression of the form uh, initial number at a location X is equal to 0.04 times the Reynolds number at location X raised to the power of 0.85 times Prandtl number 
raised to the power of one third. Okay. It estimate the surface temperature of the chip if it is dissipating 30 milliwatts. Okay, so they give us this setup of these different chips. They want off of this chip right here, they want the the heat or the sorry the surface temperature right so we have the infinity given we have our velocity of 10 meters per second this is our chip So we have this 30, and we have convection coming off of it, right? And they want us to figure out the temperature of the surface. So where would you start with this problem? What would be, like, without it even thinking about new stuff, right? If you were solving this problem back in chapter one, where would you begin? Newton's law of cooling. Newton's law of cooling, right? So we have convection coming off, Newton's law of cooling for the convection, right? We have EG, our energy generated, so we just relate those, relating them as the COE, right? And then we're putting in Newton's law of cooling. Okay, so if we do that, actually, let me do that real quick. So you see convection ends up being energy generated, right? And then we have H, A, T, S minus T infinity equal to this energy generated, right? So we're looking for T, S. We have T infinity. We have energy generated. We can calculate an area. So we don't also have the convection coefficient. So in a problem back in chapter one, they would have gave you H, right? So they don't. So here we see COE, then we put in Newton's law of cooling, and here they just rearranged for TS, right? So that means we need to figure out H, okay? And that means we need to utilize our new information, and that is our Nussel number, and they gave us a correlation. Okay, They gave us a function of that Nussel number x at, as Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Okay, And if we go back, Nussel number is a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number in our location. Okay, So there's an equation that represents that function right there. For a Nussel number, which is also that dt dy, at y equals zero, it defines what we need for convection. All right, so we do that. So we have then Nussel number hx, right over here. Over k for the fluid. Okay, so that then, and then we have our equation for Nussel number. So this is what defines Nussel number. Then we have our function, right? That also relates Nussel number to Reynolds number and Prandtl number. And that means we just need to get the Reynolds number at the chip location, Prandtl number at the chip location, and we can utilize that to solve for the convection coefficient. And that's what you see here. Plugs in our value, we get 107 watts per meter squared Kelvin, and then we can just put that in a Newton's law of cooling. Okay, so the newest, the new part in this problem is most of the steps were chapter one, right? And now it's just now we need to figure out our convection coefficient okay, for our problem. So that's the new part in this in this problem right here is instead we now knew what Nussel number looks like as Reynolds number and Prandtl number changes, 
and now we had to apply it to our problem, okay, to get our convection coefficient. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so that's it for today. Um, that's where I ended up um, stopping in the other section. So that's it. I, I might do a couple, I'll probably do a couple examples um, from Chapter 6 uh, next class. So I'm going to move the homework maybe a day or two later um, for Chapter 6. All right, any questions? Let me know. Otherwise, that's it for today. All right. Thank you.